Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's class on uh, two, two ways to begin an underpainting. I probably did not get that title correct, but uh, Chanel just, just said it. And for those of you watching on YouTube, you have it right there on the screen. Uh, so we're going to be covering two different ways that you can begin an underpainting. So getting started with acrylic painting. There are uh, a few different ways, actually, that you can begin to, to start painting, to create an underpainting or uh, a way to get started. And some people like to use pencil sketches, although uh, that can be a little tricky if your, your drawing skills are not where you want them to be because it's difficult to erase pencil uh, from a canvas. You can also use vine charcoal, which is a very thin, willowy type of charcoal that can be easily dusted off of the canvas. So you're just putting your sketch on the canvas that way before you begin painting. Or you can start the two ways that I'm gonna talk about tonight, which is using a tone or using washes to build up a painting. And we're basically on the one where we're building up washes, we're gonna start with a painted sketch. So those are kind of the two ways. It's a painted sketch with washes and then a toned painting. We're gonna end up with a similar result either way. They're just two different ways of getting started. And uh, this is a two-part class, but it's going to be a little interrupted by uh, Valentine's Day next week. So tonight's class is part one, and we will be working on creating just a little study in our sketchbook to sketch out our reference images for tonight, and then we'll get started on uh, the, the two different underpaintings. Uh, the first thing that we'll do is we'll make a little value scale of colors and I'll talk about all that in just a bit and then we'll get started on the two different underpaintings but we're not going to probably get too far uh, with that tonight although we do have an hour and a half so we'll see how far we get but we will complete our little underpainting studies or our, our little cherry studies in part two of the class but that'll be in two weeks from now and then next week's class uh hope you will still join me we'll be using one of these methods the the underpainting method where we sketch with with the paintbrush and we're going to be creating these little Valentine's Day diptychs. So you can uh, join the class with a friend or a partner if you want to make it kind of a little Valentine's date uh, situation, then the two of you can paint a diptych together or if it's just you then maybe you're just painting one panel by yourself. So I tried to make these very friendly for singles and couples, right? So maybe you might put something like this uh, self-love or dream big on your candy hearts if you're painting um, as a single. And then, you know, if you're painting with your sweetheart, you can do two of them. And I'll have a lot of different suggestions for fun stuff that we can put on the, on the candy hearts, different phrases that we can use. And I've referenced photos provided, but we will be adding our own messages to the candy hearts. And they're gonna be on these wood panels that you can get at Michael's. You can get a whole package of five of them. So you can certainly do more than one, even if you are joining that class by yourself. Uh, but in the time allowed in an hour and a half, we're only gonna probably complete one of them. So two people can complete two but I myself will, will just complete one panel uh, in, in the uh, hour and a half next week. So that's Valentine's Day. And then we'll be returning to this, this underpainting class in part two the, the following week. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna switch to my tabletop view and go over supplies and we'll get started for tonight. Okay, so don't forget to tag your work with those hashtags, make it with Michael's or Michael's classes. And you can follow me on Instagram at Adrian Hodge Art. Uh, you can also follow me on Facebook, Adrian Hodge Fine Art. And uh, Chanel has my link tree that she can drop in the chat right now. I've started a little series called uh, Online Draw Club and Online Paint Club on Saturdays. 
weekly uh, online draw club on Saturday mornings, and then a bi-weekly paint club on uh, Saturday afternoons all on Zoom. And you can join me if you like my painting style and, and drawing style and you want to keep uh, drawing and painting with me. We're just picking a different subject matter and it's drop in and you can use whatever supplies you have on hand that you prefer. Although I definitely, you know, will recommend supplies and I just kind of walk through like how I might approach um, draw drawing that subject matter. And thank you, Sue um, has been joining me for draw club. A lot of my regulars have been in these Michaels classes have been joining me there. So that's been fun. And this uh, Saturday I'm doing uh, a heart-shaped box. So if you want to join me for that, that's where you can sign up is through my link tree or uh, you can find it easily on my uh, Instagram. Okay, so uh, we are using, let me get to all the supplies that we're using tonight. We've got quite a bit of supplies that were listed there on the supply list. You can always use uh, whatever supplies you happen to have that you know, might not be the exact same brands that I purchased at Michael's, but something, um, you know, similar, like any acrylic paint will do. You don't have to use the same colors as me, etc. cetera. Um, I see some questions popping up right there about supplies. So here's what I'm using. I've got the Frederick's uh, canvas pad paper here. So we'll be using that and taping it down or or not, it's up to you. So I've got some blue tape here to tape it down. I've got this uh, golden heavy body acrylics set here, which was the same set that I used for a previous class on color theory, which I'm definitely gonna mention as we go through the class tonight. So I've just got primary colors, black and white, and then uh, a green in here as well. But we're just gonna be using red, black, and white. You're welcome to make these monochromatic uh, cherries green if you would like. If you would like to make them blue, you can. If you would like to make them uh, purple or violet, you can. So uh, it's really up to you, but I'm gonna be using red, black, and white, and we'll create a little value scale using those in just a bit when, uh, when we get started after we plan out our sketch and all that. Okay, and then I put this set of Princeton brushes on the supply list. You do not have to have these exact same brushes, but you definitely want to, my kind of recommendation is for most of classes that I teach is that folks have at least a nice round brush and then a, a flat brush and then a uh, long liner brush like this so we can get some detail in there. And then I also, in case you don't have, um, you know, the set that you bought doesn't have a liner brush, I specifically put this uh, size two over zero round brush by Princeton Velvet Touch in there because I wanted to make sure that we had something to get those fine detail. So mostly I just put that on the supply list just to emphasize the, you know, the desire that you will have while painting with me tonight for something that's going to give you some nice uh, fine detail or tonight and part two of the class. Okay, so yeah, any paintbrushes that you have will work fine, but search through your paintbrushes and hopefully you've got something that's got a nice little uh, fine point to it. And then you're gonna want some uh, palettes to mix your paint in. You're gonna want some water cups. I like to have two water cups so that I can keep one for my dark paint and one for my light paint. You're gonna want a paper towel. I have these shop towels here. And then I'm almost done, so many supplies. And then you're gonna want some pencils for sketching. I've got these Faber-Castell uh, pit graphite pencils here, and you're going to want a sketchbook for sketching as well. I've got this Canson sketchbook, so any sketch paper and pencils that you have on hand will work fine. And I think that was it. Oh, and then an eraser, which I have right there on the screen already. Okay, any questions about supplies? Jumping out. Um, I don't see any questions so far. 
Okay, great. All right. So, and then the last thing that was included in the supply list is our reference images. And I have three different versions of the reference images, which is something that I have been providing for those online draw club and paint club sessions as well. So I like to have the true uh, color photo or this this one is maybe not true color. I did put a, a bit of a filter on this one because I wanted it to have this vignette. Uh, and then hey, I have- Adrian. Oh, yeah. Sorry, do you have a PDF file for those? Because it doesn't look like Michael's added that onto the um, class page for today. I didn't have access for it. Oh, yikes. Yes, I do. Give me just one second and I can, um, well, I can easily either drop the, what's easier, dropping the PDF in the chat or. Um, I would just it? put it in the chat. That way everybody in the class has it, access to it. Okay, hang on one second. I've never added a PDF in the, the chat like this. Oh, I see where you click on file. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's like the little paper looking thing. Okay, here we go. One second. Okay, and then we can just email them, Michael's folks afterwards and let them know for the YouTube recording that that needs to be attached. Okay, it is there in the chat now. I see it, thank you. Yes, of course. All right, so we've got the, the true color here, which I put the little vignette on there because I wanted us to put a little vignette on these as well, just to, you know, create a fun little composition for us. And then I made it black and white, and I also inverted the light in it. So all of the light is dark and all of the darks are light in this inverted image. And it's a little washed out on the, the Zoom, but when you get close in on here on, on your version of it, you should be able to see some little black shapes where the highlights are on the uh, cherries. And then, you know, a lot of darker values uh, are showing up white. So all the darks are showing up white, all the uh, lights are, are showing up dark, et cetera. So that's really helpful to seeing those value shapes, especially for like these highlights on the stems and all these interesting little moments so that we can try to get those things in our painting because they make all the difference to kind of capturing the essence of, of a subject. Okay, so let's get started. Oh my goodness, drop my iPad, hang on. I just got a new case for that. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to set this aside and first let's just sketch our cherries here. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It's a pretty simple subject here. The cherries are fairly simple, but I still want to spend some time sketching them together. Let me see if I can get the image to be on the screen with my sketch. Okay, so I like to just do a couple of little thumbnail sketches. And I think the best way to gain a good understanding of these value shapes, so the shapes of the shadows and the shapes of the light that we're seeing in a reference image is to kind of draw it both ways. So we'll use our inverted light image and then we'll also use our uh, black and white one to just draw these different value shapes. So a thumbnail sketch is just a small sketch that you do in your sketchbook and you spend you know two to five minutes on it generally and it's just a way to uh, kind of get the, the rough draft going and to get a basic understanding of your composition. If you were creating your own work of art from your own 
you know, reference images or compositions, maybe this is where you decide, do I want to zoom in or do I want to zoom out? Or do I want the cherries to be kind of over to the left or down in the bottom? Or do I want my horizon line to be somewhere else, you know, because there's kind of this uh, horizon line of the paper that I photographed them on or, you know, the vignette, et cetera. I mean, I've kind of done the work for us in creating this composition, but if you were using your own, you know, subject matter, doing thumbnail sketches are a great way to work out how you want to frame your subject. But for our purposes right now, I really just want to use it to look at the light shape. So let's look at the one that's black and white and let's try to just in this sketch, we're just going to draw all of the uh, values that are showing up. So values are the dark and light of a subject. And we're just going to draw all of the values that are a 10 on the value scale. So we had a class a while back. I always end up mentioning a class I didn't tell Chanel to grab. Um, the YouTube link to, but we had a class a while back on graphite drawing pencil basics and where I just talked about the, the value scale from zero to 10 and the basics of that. So 10 is where we go to absolute black with, you know, a pencil or with our paint. And then zero is the absolute white. So this value scale from zero to 10 tells us about all the, the light and dark uh, that are that are on a subject. And so I just want to look at the 10 values on this cherry. So where it goes to an absolute uh, black 10 here and maybe some of the other values. So I definitely see it gets to black up here on this little uh, circle at the top of the, the stem. So we'll just put that little circle in there. And then I'm seeing some shadow shapes like along the edge of the stems. So we're just bouncing around and just putting where we're seeing those 10 values right now. And then on the cherry itself, it does get pretty dark, like all the way around this side and then maybe a little bit in the middle there. So we're just gonna draw this kind of crescent moon shape around the cherry where we see that it gets super dark. Feels like a cue ball right there or something. Okay, and then on this one, same, same deal. We're just looking, and if you're seeing bigger shapes than this or different shapes than this, by all means, sketch it how you're seeing it. We're not looking for perfection here. We're not looking for photorealism. At least I'm not. I'm looking to capture just the light and dark shapes that I'm seeing on these cherries. So I'm seeing something like that. And then the mid-tone values, somewhere like a five on those value scales, I'm seeing that throughout most of it in the center here, except for these moments where I see the highlights. So, and I see a bigger highlight here and then another kind of low light highlight there and then more mid-tones. Okay, so those are the, the darker shadow shapes that I'm seeing. And then let's look at the inverted light. So you really need to have your own version of this photograph because I realize mine just shows up really washed out here. Although actually I'm looking at the zoom now and it can see it a little better than I could a second ago. Okay, so now let's just draw everything that's showing up black here. So when we draw everything that's showing up black in the reference image right now, that's actually where the highlights are. So I'm seeing this shape right here is black, this shape right here, all of these black shapes are actually representing where the highlights are. So we're just drawing those shapes. We're not worried about anything else right now. We're not trying to capture the realism of these cherries. We're just looking at the, the value shapes. So I'm ending up with these kind of 
little chain link um, shapes that go down the, the stems. And then I maybe don't even have room for the, the rest of the cherries, but that's okay because we're just doing a study of the, the light here so far because that's really the focus of our underpaintings. I mean, these are very, it's a very minimal subject here. These cherries are very minimal. So all we really have to look at are these dark and light shapes. So that's what, what we're looking at right now is where's the dark, where's the light? Okay, so the highlights are pretty minimal. Like it only goes to black in a few spots where we saw those highlights, right? So that's kind of it, but I just want you to notice them. And then let's do one more thumbnail and I'm gonna zoom in a little bigger here on this one. And I wanna talk about the contours of the cherries. And I'm just gonna zoom in on the true to life uh, color here. And I want to zoom in these maybe, you know, we don't have, we don't have to worry about the stems too much here, but I just want to draw both of them nice and big and talk about the contours. So the contours are the lines that describe the surface of the form of this three dimensional form. And it's very rounded. It's very spherical, but it's not completely perfectly spherical. So we want some curved lines, definitely wrapping around the front here, but then we've got a couple of little dips and curves happening. Like we've got this one dip down here and this little kind of scoopy action because it goes inside right here. So we want to notice how our contours, if we're looking at the elevation of this cherry on the vertical axis, it's doing this. And here's another class that you might refer to if you are like, what is she talking about right now with these contours? We had some classes on getting started with uh, contour lines. I believe it was called, um, certainly if you just searched contour lines, it was the one with the limes. We redid a lot of our early concepts in the classes recently in December. Um, or I guess that was November when we did the the kind of back to basics classes talking about contour lines. Uh, anyway, so we've got this like little center here where there's a bit of a, a tunnel or like a vortex at the top of the cherry. So this is important because when we're adding our value onto our form here as we're painting, we want to make sure our brush strokes are following the contours of this form and they're just going to help, you know, make it look three-dimensional and rounded. We want to also add our value, like our light and dark in a way that uh, follows these contours. So if we just kind of slap these highlights on here without taking into account how they curve along this rounded shape, they're not going to feel quite as three-dimensional as they would if we put our highlights on this curved surface and make them curve in the same direction as our, our cherries. We've got some really interesting little um, bruises or, you know, little imperfections on the cherries here as well. So making those kind of follow that. All right. And then I'm just going to make my thumbnail a little bigger so that I can sketch the, the stems a little bit here. So on the stems, we've got cylinders for these stems. So they're coming out of the center of our little vortex is here. And they connect up here at the top. We want them to feel cylindrical. So they kind of connect like a little wishbone up here at the top. And then we can look at like the horizontal axis is doing this, curving all the way around. So as we put our value on, we want to make sure that that's happening in a way that follows the three-dimensional form. And it's possible we may not get to 
too much of this detail tonight on our uh, paintings, but that's why we have part two of this class. So this will be helpful for when we get there. And then on the vertical axis, it's pretty straight and just follow, well, it's not completely straight because the stem curves, right? But it follows the curve of the stem. And then up here at the top, it kind of is going to curve around those little knobby shapes that are happening around the top of our, our wishbone. But just understanding those contours is going to really help to, to make that feel three-dimensional. And then our shadows, those are going to, we want those to describe a flat surface. So we want those to feel flat. So we want like maybe a diagonal line, but it could still be describing a flat surface because it's straight or I like to do like some cross uh, vertical, sorry, not vertical, cross diagonal lines and cross hatching here, but that's going to make it feel nice and flat on the, the table surface. Okay, so those are little studies. I like how that went way outside of my thumbnail. <laughs> like my little sketchbook page is looking like a fun composition in and of itself right there. All right, any questions about the thumbnail sketches or these little studies here? Uh, we do actually have one question. Um, do you do this different forms every time you draw uh, from a picture or is this to show us? Thank you. Yeah, I do this every time I get started on, on any new uh, subject. And it's also helpful you know, to help you be able to draw it. But yeah, I definitely do this myself. And yeah, that's a good question because I am not perfect and I do not draw things or don't paint or draw things perfectly the first time, but definitely before a painting. I've been saying this in a lot of my classes lately, like whenever we expect ourselves to do things perfectly the first time we do them, we really set ourselves up for put a lot of unnecessary pressure on ourselves. And I think it's a common misconception that professional artists are just perfect the first time they draw or paint something. But I always do a lot of rough draft sketches. I definitely, if somebody gives me, if I take on a new commission, uh, the first thing I do with that, uh, that photograph reference image that I'm saying I'm painting a portrait of someone's child. Uh, the first thing I do when I, get the the photograph of the child before I start the commission is I play around with the light in the photo I turn up the contrast I make it black and white I invert the light um, I do whatever I can to see these value shapes and then I start sketching it and I do a lot of kind of throwaway uh, sketches I mean I don't actually throw them away but I just don't expect myself to do anything with them it's just pure practice to familiarize myself with the, the subject. Okay, so let's get our canvas paper out. I actually am going to work with a bigger size than the, the 9 by 12. So I've got a, uh, what is this, 12 by 16 pad here. But I know I've put 9 by 12 on the, the supply list, but I ran out of nine by 12 canvas paper, so I'm using this size. And um, I happen to have a couple of other examples here, uh, similar to what we're doing tonight. So I thought I would just show those real quick from some of my in-person classes that I teach here in, in Austin at the, the Contemporary right now is where I'm teaching in-person classes. So I do this at the beginning of all of my in-person painting classes too. This is like the day one activity where I practice a couple of different underpainting ways that people might start. So this was a pair using the kind of painted underpainting sketch and then starting to fill it in with washes and then the tone. So we might have something that looks like this by the end of the hour because we still have, we have right at an hour right now. So it's likely we might end somewhere like this with the cherry. So the, the image that was provided for the um, uh, the advertisement for the class was, was a good one. And then I also just happened to have this completed one of a pair um, 
as well in green. So for someone asking about the colors, you know, feel free to make blue cherries or green cherries. They don't have to be just, just red. Okay, so let's tape our canvas paper down. I did not do that when I painted uh, this one, and I honestly do not recall why. Or you know what? I did. I did paint it, tape it down. I see my little taped edge right here. I think maybe I like, I don't know. I don't know why I went back in. I think maybe I was doing touch-ups after I took the tape off, so then I ended up giving it like a rough edge. But yeah, the more I look at that, I definitely did tape it. Okay, so let's tape it off. And this will give us a nice <clears throat> little kind of elevated margin when we're done. It's so nice to peel the tape off and get that that clean edge right there. I think even when you're doing, you know, just a study like this, it's so satisfying to have that that clean edge. And my camera doesn't quite reach where I want it to go. Just turn my, my little mat board this way. Okay, so I like to go kind of half on and half off the the canvas paper and then tape it down to, you could tape it down to a piece of masonite board or a piece of cardboard would be good. And then you could set that aside and easily come back to this, even if you don't, you know, have a, a permanent workspace to keep your painting. If you're a kitchen table painter, then you can set it aside like that. And then we're not gonna go all the way to the edge on the other side. I wanna give ourselves a little margin here. So I'm gonna tape it with like just some negative space hanging off over here. And I did the same thing with this one so that we can have our, do our little value scale off to the side. But hang on, I just got a little bubble in that when I taped it. So you, you want it to be nice and flush. You don't want a bubble. Let me fix that. Oh my gosh, I still have a bubble. What is going on? Let me do the top and the bottom first. I'm gonna do that last. I'm getting ahead of myself. You're not gonna be able to see my top and my bottom, but doing it exactly the way I just did the sides there. Um, while you're doing that, Adrian, what is the difference between canvas paper and stretched canvas? Um, there's not too much difference between the canvas itself. One is just stretched across a, you know, a wood frame, and the other one is just the, the loose canvas paper. So back in the, the olden days, the old masters often would paint on just loose uh, canvas, and then they would roll it up and then travel to the next town or wherever they were delivering it to, maybe to the king or something, and then then they would take it out of and stretch it across a frame. So that was actually pretty common practice. So it's not not a new idea to just paint on the the loose canvas. And I like doing it because it's a lot more uh, easy, you know, to store and it's a little less expensive. And then if you paint something that you just fall in love with and you really want it to be in a frame, then you take it to a frame shop, like the frame shop at Michael's and they can easily pop it into a frame for you. And then you can hang it on the wall. So it's not like it, there's anything less than uh, when it comes to painting on a canvas paper. And I use, canvas paper for my in-person painting classes as well. I recommend that to students also because I think not putting pressure on yourself to have something frame worthy each time you do, you know, a paint study is a good way to work. And then this way, yeah, you don't put as high of expectations on yourself if you're not 
working on a, a big fancy stretched canvas. And then one more question for you. Um, is your paper oriented horizontally or vertically? Uh, horizontally. So just like this one, I'm just working with a bigger, uh, bigger piece of canvas paper this time. So yeah, my paintings might be a little bigger than, than last time. Although actually, let me get them so that they you know, just tape off again so that they kind of can fit within the my camera frame here. I'll do like that. And then that'll be pretty much the same size as the other ones. Okay, thank you for those questions. All right, so let's get our palettes out and start prepping our our colors here. So like I said, I'm just using red, black, and white, but you're welcome to use any other colors that you want. Um, also, I'm not going to make a grayscale like I did in this example. So you might have noticed that off to the side, I have a little bit of a grayscale here. Or like on this one, I have a grayscale, but I do recommend if you struggle with the concept of this value scale of a color that you check out the color theory uh, basics class that Chanel dropped in the chat, or you can find it on YouTube. It was two part class back in um, November, I believe. And we made a value scale um, a grayscale, and then we made a value scale of a color. So that's what we're going to do right now, just to make sure that we have several different values uh, for this monochromatic study of the, the cherries here. But whatever you do, any value scale that you make, so if you're working with green, for example, you would put the green right in the center, and then you would add black to the green to get shades of green. And I'm about to do this with the, the red and the white, but I just wanted to show you, you know, how you could do it with any color. And then you're adding white to get your tints of the green. But sometimes people have a, you know, just hard time with, with this. And so the first level here that you might start with is to just use black and white. And so you're gonna find kind of your mid uh, value, which is, an equal balance of black and white, and then uh, you know mix together more white than black to get all of these lighter grays, and then more um, black than white to get all of these uh, darker grays. So just just a full gray scale there from white to black, and that's what we did in that color theory basics class. But we're just going to do another little value scale here with just the red and the black and white. And the reason for this is because we have lots of different values represented here on these cherries. And we're just doing a monochromatic painting here, which means one color. But each color has the full value scale of that color represented you know, on any subject that that has has color. So just looking at our our cherries here, even though these cherries are pretty dark, we've got this kind of main hue here. the the medium hue would be this like the brightest red that we can see here. And then everywhere we've got like, this kind of light pink or these, these highlights, you know, they don't just jump from red to white. There's some moments that are a little like, that are, yeah, just like a little light pink throughout here. And we're maybe gonna exaggerate some of those a little bit. And then we're also making this whole thing monochromatic and it definitely gets pretty light in the background here. So that's really where, where we're gonna use the pink the most is in the background. And we're going to want these like these lighter values of pink for the background. And then we're definitely going to want them for a few of these moments of the highlights. 
but most of the cherries are going to be our main red, a little tiny bit of pink and white, and then a lot of shades of the, the red here because it does get pretty dark. But then we want that pink for the background to really make our monochrome pop, uh, monochromatic painting pop. And then if you're doing, you know, like a, a green scale here, same idea. You're going to want this full value scale of green so that you can use like the lighter green in the background, the darker greens on the, the cherries, et cetera. You know, or maybe if you're doing a blue scale, I just happen to have these examples right here, then same idea. So we're just prepping our palette. We're getting an understanding of all these values and then we're mapping out where they're going to go and making sure that we, you know, are accounting for, we, we've we got the value prepped when we need it, even if, um, you know, we'll have to do this again before our, our second session as well. Plus, it just looks nice having that little value scale off to the side there, so. All right, so I'm going to take one of my paint brushes. I'm going to use this little uh, flat, brush. And we're just going to start making, well, first let's start while we have red, black, and white all nice and uh, separated here. Let's just go ahead and dip our paintbrush in our, our water cup to get it a little wet because we've got acrylic paint, which is water soluble, and it's nice to get our paint moving nice and fluid. And let's just paint a little swatch of, got this really long paintbrush and then my, <laughs> my camera is just like bumping it no matter where I go. Uh, let's paint a little swatch of red. I'm gonna make it nice and big actually since I got this big canvas paper. Might as well paint a big swatch. And then we'll clean our brush and you just paint the bottom of the cup to get all of the paint off of your paintbrush. I teach a lot of beginners painting classes and um, you might be wondering why is she telling us to paint the bottom of the cup? Because people are like, oh no, there was still paint from the last <laughs> brush you know, strokes that I was doing. And when I tried to just paint white, it had red in it. So if you paint the bottom of the cup, that's how you can make sure you get all of your paint off of your paintbrush. And then if you dab it on the paper towel, you shouldn't see any pink coming off of it. That's how you know you got your brush clean. So sometimes people are like, I'm trying to make a green and somehow, you know, it's looking brown. And it's like, well, maybe you still have some red in your paintbrush because you didn't clean it all the way and now it's getting in there and turning your you know your colors something else okay so and then we'll paint a little swatch of white down here even if we can't see it all that well it's still good to have it there so that we can see it in relationship to that uh, very light pink that we're going to make in just a moment and then I'm just saving some of this white because I'm kind of running low on white paint also, I'm using different water cups for my light and dark here. So if you want to, you know, use your second water cup for your lighter values and your other water cup for your darker values, that's a good way to keep from having to re replace your water cups too much. All right, and then we'll make our little swatch of black as well. Like guide my paintbrush and a path around my camera here every time. And we don't need 10 values here. Let's just try to get, you know, at least two or three tints and shades going. Maybe two shades and and one or yeah, three, three tints and two shades I think would be good. Because the, the black loves to absorb lighter colors. It's it's kind of tricky to get these shades to have too much variation here. 
All right, let's start with the tints actually though. So the tints are the little uh, red or main hue plus white. So I've taken some of my white to a separate area of my palette here and now I'm just gonna barely add some red to it to try to get that like baby's breath of pink going. I'm looking across the room to where I have a big uh, tube of white paint that I may have to grab because I'm running very low on my white here and we're going to use a lot of pink. Okay, so that's maybe not the lightest pink that I want. I'm going to go ahead and make an even lighter one and make that my second one. They don't have to go in order of value here. It's okay if your value scale is not perfectly in order, but I want mine to look nice and pretty for you. So, all right, that's looking really pale pink. I know it's showing up kind of still white on the, the screen, but when I paint it there next to my white, you can see there's just a tiny bit of that pink pigment in there. Okay, I said three tints, but then I'm not leaving myself enough room to do three. I might have to mess up the perfect little value scale here. Do one more off to the side because I definitely want something in between that and that red. I'm just gonna add some red to this pink that I already have. Maybe a little bit more white as well. There we go. All right, so I was hoping to squeeze this in between those other two, but I ran out of room. All right, so three tints, and then let's make a couple of shades. And you can do more. Let's see how many I had on the last one. I think I had two tints that looked very similar on this other one here. Uh, these two, which were very similar, and then this one and this one. So I had about three all in all. Um, I have a question for you, Adrian. Do you prefer titanium white or over zinc white, which has greater tinting strength? Okay, so your titanium white is your most opaque white and your zinc white is not uh, as opaque. So zinc white is kind of uh, good for mixing, I guess, um, or it's more commonly used for mixing. And then titanium white is going to be your like, you know, to try to get your highlights and it's the most opaque, but I do default to titanium white quite a bit. So, and uh, when you read the back of your uh, your tubes of paint, they often will tell you, like, they'll talk about the opacity level, how opaque they are. Um, like, it's, um, it's deceiving, but some of your darker colors are actually more transparent than, um, you know, like, titanium white is more opaque than maybe this uh, this red might be. That's, that's just an example, but titanium white's the most opaque. So that's why I tend to default to it. Okay, so let's take some red off to the side now and add a little black to it. And the reason why I'm taking some of my colors like off to a new area to create a tint or a shade is just because I wanna keep my main like, you know, 
stockpile of that color uncontaminated by the the other colors if I were to just like I did go ahead and add red to that original pile of white and now it's all pink right so I don't have my pile of white anymore and if I just started adding black to this red then I wouldn't have my main red anymore so it's just a way to keep your your colors um a little more you know separated and I always make a mess of my palette so that's one of those do as I say not as I do rules Okay, so I added quite a bit of black to this. That's a little more than I meant to. So I'm going to add a little more red to it. So you want to be really slow about how you're adding these darker colors because the darker color is always going to eat the lighter color. All right, that's pretty good. It's a nice shade of red that's like a little bit darker than our hue. And we really, like I said, don't have a whole lot of variation between the reds on the cherries. We're going to be using these, you know, deeper shades of red a lot in the background for that vignette. It's really only, you know, these two, two or three shades on the cherry and then, you know, that highlight. Okay, and then we'll add a little bit more black to it. To get that darker shade of red. And you can definitely make more of these tints and shades. Like I said, if you want to develop your value scale a little more here and have, you know, just a better understanding of how black and white affect a color, or definitely do your little grayscale later on your own time to help with that. And you, you know, can do that for any color. Like in my in-person, an in-person class this morning, I have a gouache painting class at the Contemporary Austin. And uh, there was a student who was not there when I did the color theory class earlier in the, the session. And they were really struggling today when we were working on a portrait and we were doing a monochromatic portrait actually, but um, she was just really struggling with, she was doing kind of like a two tone with purple and blue and she was having a hard time understanding how to get the different values because she ha just hadn't stopped and, you know, done this. And I was like, I would just take a moment to do this with your you know, with all your purples, make a value scale of purple and make a value scale of blue. And then you can see, because she was like, well, which one is lighter? My, you know, my violet that I made or my blue or my red. And I'm like, they're actually all the same value. They're just different colors, you know, like just because you added more red than blue to that one or more blue than red to that one, like they're still kind of the same value. So anyway, that that's a real world application of, of where that's helpful because she was having a hard time figuring out how to map that out, having not done that before. Okay, so let's get started on these underpaintings. So if you want to put another piece of tape kind of right down the center here, you are welcome to do that. Or if you want to draw a line with your pencil, down the center because you know we're kind of dividing this little visual plane in half here in the center so I'll just go ahead and draw a pencil line down the middle and I'm going to be kind of scooching back and forth here so I'll, I'll make sure you can see whichever one I'm on even if I, I actually let me move my camera a little bit so it's more centered here on top. Okay, that looks pretty good. All right, so first we're gonna make a tone and then we're gonna make an underpainted sketch. And our underpainted sketch is basically just gonna be 
a sketch that we're going to do with our paint. And this is why I wanted you to have a nice little liner brush like this so that you could, you know, really draw with your, your paintbrush. So if you, if the, you know, smallest brush that you have is like this, maybe like that one that came in that one set, uh, having something like this will definitely help you to, to draw or, or one like this. So that's why I added though that that extra one for the supply list because I wanted to make sure that you had at least one kind of fine liner brush like that. And actually I want to do one more thing before we get started here to help you to be able to kind of draw with your paintbrush. So let's take we just did this in the, the gouache class that we had um, at the beginning of January, or I guess a few weeks ago, it already feels like that was a long time ago somehow. Um, but if you were there for that class, you recall we kind of did a bunch of little brushstroke practice with our different paintbrushes. Let's do that a little bit with just, you know, whatever liner brush you happen to have um, so that we can kind of gain some confidence with drawing with a paintbrush. And I'm just looking for my sketch that I hid behind me over here. So we're gonna be kind of sketching in the basic idea of our, our cherry sketch, but we're gonna do it with our paintbrush. And <clears throat> we're gonna water down our, um, one of our reds first. Like let's just use maybe this darkest tint that we had here. And you can just take your paintbrush and just drip it into your, your little well of your palette here to add some water to it. I just happen to have an eyedropper with some water. So I'm going to use that instead of, I, my camera is really in the way of these long <laughs> paintbrushes today. Okay, so I'm going to mix that up and I'm looking for like a really nice kind of fluid. Actually, that's a little too thin. I'm going to add some red to it. And maybe some white too. Oh, I'm just messing up my whole palette now. I want it to be kind of like yogurty, like really, you know, runny yogurt. That's the consistency that I'm looking for to be able to draw with it with our paintbrush. And then let's do a little bit of brush stroke practice kind of in the margin. So <clears throat> you taped off the edge here and you have, you know, like this little area over here where we did the, the value scale, you can do it there, or I happen to have this extra little space that I taped off up here at the top. We'll just take our paintbrush and just with the full pressure uh, on it, drag it along and see how thick of a line we can make with that paintbrush if we put the full pressure on the paintbrush. I like to say a paintbrush is like a sponge. And if we have a sponge full of soap and water and we press down on that sponge, all of the soap and water is gonna come out of it. But if we just barely touch that sponge, only a little bit is gonna come out of it. So that's how thick our lines could be if we put the full pressure on our paintbrush. But if we do very little pressure, then let's see how thin of a line we can make. So I can make a really thin line with my paintbrush if I just put very little pressure. And I like to lock, you really wanna lock your arm or lock your wrist, I'm sorry, and make the uh, the movement come from your entire arm. So think about how you're kind of moving your bicep and just dragging along with your whole arm. And that's gonna help you get control over the marks that you're making to be able to draw with your paintbrush. But let's say, as you're drawing your little cherry underpainting here, you make a mark that you don't want to be there. Well, guess what? Paint is not permanent, especially if you catch it quickly. So let's say I make a mark like that and I'm like, oh no, I don't want that to be there. Well, if I really quickly grab my big paintbrush and some water and just scrub it real quick with some water and then take my paper towel, look, it's like it was never there. So that's how we can erase as we're drawing with our paint brushes here. I'm gonna do that one more time in case you missed it, okay? I made a mark, I don't want it to be there. 
I want to erase it, take my big paintbrush, scrub over it real quick, grab it out with the paper towel. It's like it was never there. Okay, but you got to do it fast. And you want your paint to be watered down. If you're drawing with really thick paint, then it might dry before you can uh, rub it out like that. Okay, so we've got runny yogurt thinned out paint here. Let's do, I think I said I was gonna do the tone first and then I was like, nope, changed my mind. And so we're prepping to do our little underpainting sketch. So let me show you my, my pear example one more time. So see how I kind of drew with my paintbrush to get the sketch of the pear on there. That is why, uh, that's how we're, we're getting started like that. Oh, I just saw Sammy's comment and I want to read it. How have I gone this many years not knowing you could erase paint? Mind blown, I love it. Yeah, I know that's one of those, when I used to teach at a couple of paint and sip establishments, um, you know, the places where you go for the, the wine and paint uh, parties. That was always the first thing I covered when painting with wine is, hey, guess what? It's not permanent. We can erase it. Here's how we do that. Um, and always set people's mind at ease. Okay, so let's, you know, if you want to look at your sketch again, or if you want to look at the, the photo reference, whatever you want to do to to sketch your little cherries in here. But let's also take note of the overall composition. So we want to make sure that we're, you know, fairly zoomed in, that you give yourself a lot of space to explore the details. Like we don't want these cherries to be teeny tiny within our, our little picture frame here that we've made. But we also don't want them to be uh, too zoomed in so that we can't explore this vignette that I want to put around them. So <clears throat> let's actually, yeah, let's start with the up here at the top of the, the stem. Like where'd my other example go? I'm gonna see how, like for context where I started, I was started about a third of the way down there. And then the cherries themselves are about a third of the way up from the bottom. So if you wanna try to frame it like that, that would be good. Okay, so right off the bat, I went way too wet here with my paint. Like I watered it down so much to try to get y'all to water yours down and then mine's a little too thick. So give me just a second. That's actually probably good because if it's too wet, then it's, you know, you end up with like a little puddle line when you try to draw with it. All right, that's good. So just keeping in mind those those little value shapes, we got our little wishbone. And again, don't try to aim for perfection here. And both of our cherries are going to look probably a little different from each other. Like the stems may not be the exact same on both of them. I made mine a little thick. I'm gonna do my little eraser thing and make it a little, a little thinner on that side. And it really doesn't have to be super detailed either. I mean, as much as you need to be able to, you know, get your bearings on these, these cherries here. We're just looking for the basic, basic shapes. But I definitely want to get my little 
vortex in there in the center. And I definitely want to get my highlights on there. And then maybe even some of those, those big shadowy shapes. Or something like that. Also, I didn't notice when we were sketching it again, I forgot there's this like little dent over here in the side. Any imperfections in fruit are really great to go ahead and put those imperfections in because it just makes it more interesting. Makes it feel more like a cherry. Okay, and then we've got our big shadow. It's actually kind of a double shadow on there. And I did put those in when I was painting them before. So maybe you put the double shadow in even in your underpainting sketch. And they're just barely kind of kissing each other. They're not overlapping. They're just barely touching. Also, in case y'all are wondering, I took this photo over the summer during cherry season and I just sat on it thinking this would be a good Good one to use around Valentine's Day because it just had a Valentine's vibe with the cherries kissing each other. Anytime I get a good looking piece of fruit, I got to make a little still life of it on my desk and take some pictures. I've got so many stored up. I've got like a watermelon I haven't used yet. Mango. One day we'll have a mango class and then maybe you'll remember me saying that. All right, that's pretty good. And then we want our little horizon line back there. So I'm just kind of looking at where the horizon line comes in, like behind the, the stem there. And I'm just going behind the stem so that it looks like the stems are in front. And then, oh my gosh, I did not make my line very straight. I'm going to fix it. Um, do you always or typically use the mid-tone color to sketch? Yeah, I try to use a, a lighter color. So yeah, I really was trying to start with a tint, but then I made it a little too watery. So I added some red to it. But the, the lighter, the better so that it's easy to cover up. Yellow is a good color to use if you're, you know, you're doing like a full color painting because yellow is, you know, the lightest color that's going to be easy to cover up, but still visible. It's a good question. I had a, a professor in college. Uh, her name is Melissa Miller. You should look her up if you're not familiar with her work. She is a uh, world-renowned painter. She was such an incredible painter. I was so honored to be able to learn from her. And I'm, I'm sure she didn't come up with the yellow painted sketch, but she's the one who taught that to me. Okay. So that's our under painting sketch here for the, the one side. And then we want to get the tone going for the other side. And like I said, we maybe you're not going to get too much farther than, you know, something similar to this. And I didn't get super far with, with that one in the in-person class either. So, but that's why we've got the whole other hour and a half to pick up where we are going to leave off tonight. Oh my goodness. Yikes. I probably had it set to 7 p.m. since that's when the old cutoff 
used to be for our class. I had a telemarketer calling me at 710. So sorry, y'all. Okay, so let's get our tone going. So we are going to want quite a bit of, um, let's go with, we're going to just make our tone match the kind of the lightest color in the background. So we're going to use a, a tint. And I usually do tell people to start with like a mid-tone or a tint for the tone. Let's go with like the this lightest uh, tint or maybe like our medium color uh, tint right here. And I am just going to grab a bigger tube of white paint that I have across the room real quick because I am running out of white. Okay, so we want a nice uh, big pile of this tint color here for our tone. I think when mixing colors, sometimes I tell people, you know, they're like, how much do I mix? Do I mix a lot? Because if I mix a lot, it might go to waste. If I mix not enough, then I'll have to make more. Um, and it really just depends on what you're doing. But for this, I definitely think mixing more is a good idea because if we run out of the color halfway through and then have to make some more, it might be kind of hard to match it. And then uh, our tone will end up being, you know, two different tones. So a palette knife would be good for this right now, but I don't have one handy. I usually don't use palette knives to mix either because I usually just mix a small amount, but I just like poured out so much white from that big tube. All right, let me move some over here. All right, so I'm making a pretty nice sized little pile here of my, my tint of pink. That is a little darker than I wanted it to be. So let me use more white. All right, that's pretty good. All right, and then I really did not need this much because we're gonna water it down a little bit, folks. So I just told you to make a bunch, but maybe that's good. Cause maybe if I hadn't said that, you wouldn't make a lot. I think it's better to have too much than run out and need to, to make some more, but we are gonna water it down cause we want it to be not super washy, but we do want it to be thin. So I'm gonna take maybe that much over here to the side. And I'm gonna add some water to it. You can just drip some water from your, your water cup into it. And I guess, yeah, kind of like that runny yogurt amount is good. And really that's just like a good rule of thumb. I teach a lot of oil and acrylic painting classes lately in person and, um, there's that fat over lean rule with oil painting. And that says, you know, to start with uh, that you're thinned out paint and then don't use your thick paint until, you know, you're in your like later layers, your last layers. That's also just a good rule of thumb to use with water media too. So with acrylic paint starting kind of thin and washy, like you can always go thicker. But when you start out thick, you're kind of stuck with thick, you know? And I think you just have more control when you uh, start super thin. 
Um, but we don't want it to be too thin because we are going to build on this uh, this tone here. So we're going to you know, basically we're going to start with the tone and then we're going to start. We're not going to paint the sketch on. Instead, we're going to look at those shapes that we outlined earlier. So it's just two different ways of getting started, right? So but the first thing we're doing is we're just taking our big flat brush and we're just filling up this entire area with this tone of paint. So I'm just spreading it around, knocking my camera with my long paintbrush. I have another question for you, Adrian. Okay. Um, do you leave your brush in the water when you're not using it or do you clean, dry it and take it out? Um, that's a good question. I leave it in the water cup. Um, I think that's a good idea because you can't know that it's totally clean until you clean it with, you know, soap and water or, um, you know, if you're painting with oil until you clean it with a cleaner. And so, yeah, sometimes like that's how you ruin your brushes is by leaving them lying on a paper towel while you're not using them. So definitely recommend leave them face down in your water cup until you're ready to clean them thoroughly. Okay, so if you don't have a piece of tape here dividing your two little quadrants, um, try to use some nice brushstroke control right here at the edge so we don't go into our, our other painted area. Okay, so there are so many benefits to starting with a tone. Um, a lot of times when I'm teaching my painting one class in oil and acrylic, and I have people do this on the first day, people have never painted with a tone before. Nobody ever told them about it. And it's their first time hearing it. And maybe it's your first time hearing about it too. And they're like, wow, this is a game changer. I'm always going to start my paintings this way. And a lot of people do. A lot of painters always start with a tone on the canvas. Maybe you've noticed like, painters that you follow on Instagram have like this, uh, you know, layer of orange or pink or, you know, a color like that underneath, you know, their, their painting that's in progress and you've wondered about it. Um, starting with a nice warm color like orange is really popular because it does a lot of things. For one, it helps you to like build, build up using these value shapes and everything. It can also really inform, you know, every layer that you put on, on top of it. Like having orange underneath is the nice one because it, it kind of adds like just a warmth to everything that you paint over it. So it's a, it's a very common practice to start. Oh my God, I keep bumping the camera with this long paintbrush. The trials of painting on zoom okay so there's my tone i'm just i went a little too watery with it it's like hard to find that perfect moisture level i was looking for so i'm just kind of fixing my little puddles that are showing up so we want this to dry kind of quickly before we add on to it so let's leave it alone for a second and let it dry a little bit um, and go ahead and start working on the the other one. So we're just going to bounce back and forth between the, the two of these. So while we're waiting for that to dry, we'll start building up some washes on these cherries. So a good another good rule of thumb when you're painting is to paint from the background forward and um, just kind of start with the background and paint towards the, the foreground, right? So we want to start with our, our background here. And with our tone, we already have, look, the background's already done. So that's another benefit of it is that, I mean, the background's not done, done, but there's something on it. We've also, when we start to build our light and dark values onto this, we've already got our kind of mid-tone or our tint in a few places where we need it. So a lot of, um, a lot of parts of the painting process get filled in really quickly and it kind of moves things along in the, the toned uh, painted version of an underpainting. 
Okay, so for our, our painted underground, under underground, underpainting sketch, now we're gonna build up washes over here. So a little more washier than we started with the tone. So the tone was a little thicker than these washes that we're gonna use. And I just keep pulling out this example because this one's just, you know, in such the early stages. So really washy uh, washes. So let's see, for our background, we want the same light pink that we used on the tone, but we're just gonna water it down even more. And then let's go ahead and make I still have kind of a wash of my my color that I used to sketch with. That one's still pretty washy. And then, so let's just have like a tint wash, a mid-tone wash, and then maybe that, you know, main hue. Let's water that down. And then let's also make a shade wash. I really did not consider my camera with these long stems of these paintbrushes. It's so tricky trying not to hit the camera with them every time. All right, how are we doing on time? Oh my goodness, 722, that came up fast. Okay, we can go a few minutes over here. We were just talking about that at the start. If we, I'm not gonna go more than five minutes over, but I might go just, yeah, four or five minutes over here so that I can at least get a little bit going on the tone here in just a moment. But first let's fill in a little bit on our, our background here. And we're also going to go ahead and get, so it's a little thinner and washier here than with the tone, but we also want to go ahead and get our vignette going. I mean, we're definitely going to add that vignette on top of the tone, but with the washier one, we want to try to match our values as we go. So I'm just taking that darker shade and I'm kind of swooshing it in like curtains across the the top and the bottom here. And so the object of this underpainted, the underpainting is always to get some paint on every every inch of the canvas right away. So whether you're starting with a tone, or you're starting with these this underpainted sketch and the washes, you're still working to quickly get some paint on every, every inch of the canvas as quickly as possible. And that is a good rule of thumb because a lot of people tend to avoid certain areas of their painting because they're afraid of messing up that part of the painting. And by putting in a thin, wash like this, you're basically breaking the ice all over your painting. There's no part of your painting that is going to intimidate you because you've already put some paint down right there and you're not avoiding it. And then also, um, what's the other reason? You can visualize where you're going because you've got a little wash representing each different value a little faster. And also you're not getting attached to this underpainting, it's it's an underpainting, so it's underneath. And when we treat the first layer of the paint painting that we're working on as if it's the last layer, you know that's that same sort of perfectionism that we were trying to avoid when we were sketching it by doing those thumbnails right off the bat. We don't expect ourselves to be perfect with the the first thing that we do. Or if we are doing that, we're trying, hopefully trying to break that as a, a habit because, you know, perf what is it? 
perfect is the enemy of of the good. Okay, so that's the background's all filled in and I've got a little bit of that vignette showing up already. And then now I'm gonna use a smaller brush and wash in some of these darker values. And like I said, we're not being scared or intimidated by any part of these cherries. So we're filling it in. And things don't have to perfectly match all of the values. You just really want to get a nice little wash in every every area. I might be leaving some gaps mostly because I'm afraid of it um, bleeding because I, I got it a little too wet. So maybe take your time a little bit more than I am here. Like I might leave the stems alone just because I don't want it to all bleed together too much. That's good. We got some... I got some paint in almost every spot and I'm just leaving the highlights alone. And this is going to dry and this is just a first layer, but yeah, so we broke the ice there. Okay. And then let me see how we do it on time. I just want to put a little bit over here on the tone and then I want to see some of y'all's examples. And then we'll call it a night until we meet again for this one in a couple weeks or meet again next week for the Valentine's diptych still. Okay, so for the tone now, uh, we want to start with either our lights or our darks. And people always ask me, which one? Which one would you start with? And it's like, well, it depends. I go back and forth. I don't always start with the lights and I don't always start with with the darks but this time we can go ahead and be uh thick about it like some of these brush strokes that we put on may end up being the ones that we you know leave until the end of the painting so i'm going to use my white here and you know but if they're not if you end up painting over them that's fine too but I'm going to look at my black and white photo off to the side here, and I'm looking at those highlighted shapes that we drew when we did the, the thumbnail. I go along the stem. And I'm keeping it kind of implied because that line was not like a perfect white line all the way down. Remember, we kind of had that little chain link thing happening all down the little wishbone. And then on the cherries themselves, we had the little highlights. So I am going pretty thick with this, mostly just to make it like show up on the camera. Hey, hey Adrian, are you using white or the lightest pink right now? I'm using just the white. So those are like my absolute white highlights right there. Thank you. I'm trying to just get some, some contrast going real quick. I'm just gonna do a little bit of black and white and then I'm gonna stop. I just want to get a little bit on the tone, but you're welcome to to keep going and jump ahead if you want here. Um, okay, and then I'll do the same thing with, actually, I'm not going to use just the black. I'm going to use a little bit more of a shade with the red here. Because I can always add the black on top of it. Um, I think it might be a little bit more interesting with more of a shade. So I've got like a, like a nine on that value, like this dark of a shade. Go ahead and put like that little value at the top of the stem and maybe a few of these 
little moments. I'm just trying to make some fun contrast happen right now and to show you how this tone can be so beneficial and why people love working with the tone when they've never done it before. Because we can really just make it pop and come to life so quickly. I might go ahead and just start painting my cherry in nice and bold. And you can make this a little more thinned out and watery if that, you know, makes you feel more confident and comfortable. And then, yeah, we can just keep painting on top of it now because we've already got our, you know, the background tone. So we just keep building on these highlights and low lights and it might come together really quickly like definitely in that other example that I showed you um of the pair you could see how the the toned pair like it is a fast process like the tone does speed things up quite a bit I'm going to stop there just because I feel like I'm rushing uh, myself and just like pull out that pair again real quick but see how quickly my toned pair was starting to like shape up like it's almost like you're sculpting the form with the the dark and light values you're not thinking about the drawing quite as much so you're still getting to the same result you know eventually either way but the toned uh method gets you there a little faster sometimes and then but it's just it's a preference it's not like one is better than the other it's just two ways of getting started here so i'm going to stop there and leave it alone and we will continue on in uh, two weeks. Uh, but I want to switch back to my forward facing. And just for a few minutes, uh, if you want to hold up some of your examples, I'd love to see your examples. We can spotlight you, see how far you got with these underpaintings. Thank you, Sammy. Love that feedback. All right. Yes. That's beautiful, Carol. Yeah, I love the, the sketched one and the toned one. They're both coming along so nice. Oh, I love your clear board. You've got them taped down too. That's fun. All right. Let me see. Oh, and it disappeared into your background. Kind of hard to see it. It's getting blurred out. Oh, I see it now. Okay, nice. Going a little little thicker with your your vignette so far um okay that's a nice oh I love how soft those those lines are that's really lovely how soft your your washes are there and then my little zoom windows are covering your toned one when we move it oh yeah look at that high contrast that's beautiful Becky thank you Hey, oh, that is really gorgeous. Look at those contours. Those are coming across so strong so far. I love it. Can you turn it the other way? Can you turn it horizontal? All right, there we go. Yeah, that's looking nice. Looks like you just got your tone is maybe, oh, I see the highlights there on the tone. Yeah, that's a lovely start. I like that green tape. Oh, that's beautiful as well. Yeah, maybe before the night's over, go ahead and fill in the rest of your washes over there on the left. I'm worried that might, you know, dry and then be kind of hard to, to fill in if anybody else is stopping like that. Go ahead and fill in the rest of those washes. Even if you don't have time to do any more, that was beautiful. Oh, yeah, look at those nice contours on the left there. And that high contrast on the one on the right looks like your tone is super light but I can see the the really high contrast of the the dark red that you added so far lovely Ooh, look at that one 
some of these, it's just nice when I can see them nice and close up on the camera. Yeah, that's really great. I love all your brush strokes there on the, the left are really lovely so far. I know I'm like, it's just a first layer. Don't get too attached to it, but it is nice when your underpainting can is that strong and like already showing those contours. It's definitely nice to build on when you've got that good base. All right, yeah. Beautiful starts. Oh yeah, that's another really strong one with the, the contours are really coming across. And Juan, I think that's my buddy Juan, who's become a regular. Yep, there you are. Nice to see you. Really nice. I like your brushstroke practice over there on the side. Oh, and your stems have a really good character to them too, Juan. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love how your brushstrokes are so unique, like you're really starting really kind of slow, like little dotted lines there. That's a great, great method. Okay, wow, so many folks are wanting to to share. I don't want to go too over time here. Let's let's do maybe two more and then we'll stop. Okay, Rebecca. I was going to say, there's only two more after this one, so oh, there isn't okay, many left. Perfect. Okay, nice. Yeah, that's lovely. Oh, I love that soft pink you're using so far there. I love how all of these cherries just have such different like gesture pose to them. And these are like kind of, that one's like leaning in to the, the other one. Nice. And look how neat and tidy your value scale is over there on the left. Beautiful. All right. Thank you all so much. This was so fun. I'm excited to finish these. I'm impatient, but we have to wait two weeks. So next week will be, you saw them, the, the, candy hearts. So hopefully you'll join me for that. And you can always sign up for my online draw club or paint club if you want to keep drawing and painting with me uh, this weekend. All right. Thank you all. Have a, a wonderful rest of your evening. Good night. Thank you, Chanel.